Between five and six million people live in Hong Kong. Half of them are post-World War II refugees from China. Most arrive penniless. Today, many of these immigrants have become successful businessmen, manufacturers, and farmers. But the majority are factory workers who enjoy the second or third highest living standard in Asia. Their children, in turn, are better educated. Many become middle-class professionals or white-collar workers. How could millions of impoverished immigrants prosper in a territory devoid of material resources except for an excellent harbor? In a land, moreover, which received virtually no foreign aid at all after World War II, which makes no special concessions to overseas investors, how did this prosperity come about? I first came here in 1963 as a Chinese language student. Since then, I've been back nine times, largely to study the workings of Hong Kong's economy. This small territory is the 19th largest trading community in the world. It is one of the foremost international banking and financial centers and a showcase in Asia for the West. Above all, however, Hong Kong demonstrates that a purely market economy can operate for the benefit of everybody. Hong Kong's free economy serves not only those who live here, but also the government in Peking across the border. You might think such a situation hard to believe, that in a place which Peking regards as part of China, there flourishes the most successful free economy in the world. A 20th century economy run on the supposedly antiquated ideas of the 19th century, Hong Kong is viewed by some as an economic miracle. On the face of it, this seems almost incredible. Let's begin with a few basic facts. The British Crown Colony of Hong Kong lies inside the tropics on the southeast coast of China. The territory consists of a small part of the Chinese mainland and a scattering of offshore islands of which the most important is Hong Kong Island. There are two large cities, Victoria on Hong Kong Island and Kowloon on the peninsula directly facing the harbor. The total land area of the entire territory is just over 400 square miles. Of this, some three quarters is marginal, unproductive land. Only 12% is useful for farming. Most of Hong Kong's people live and work within 25 square miles. Since only one-seventh of its land is arable, Hong Kong cannot feed itself, and throughout most of its history has had difficulty in providing adequate water supplies. Virtually all materials for industry and the vast majority of foodstuffs must be imported for the more than five million people crowded into the limited living space of the territory. Chronic shortage of land has always been one of Hong Kong's chief concerns. The British began land reclamation within 10 years of their occupation in 1841. Today, Hong Kong is almost one huge construction site and they literally move mountains into the sea to create land for development. Land is the most prized commodity in Hong Kong reflecting its relative scarcity. Acute water shortage has also posed severe difficulties. There are no rivers and only a few streams. Because of this absence of internal resources, Hong Kong depends heavily upon external trade. Its massive imports add up to a huge bill, which is met by the colony exporting over 90% of its manufactured goods plus the sale of banking and financial services, and the inflow of funds from overseas, both for investment and safekeeping. Over 98% of the people are Chinese. About half were born in Hong Kong and have spent their whole lives here. The great majority of the population live within approximately 10,000 acres. Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. 
This section of Kowloon, the Mong Kok district, has nearly half a million people per square mile. Hong Kong has willingly accepted refugees throughout its brief history. Hundreds of thousands entered during the Sino-Japanese War in the 1930s. Still another great influx took place in the Chinese Civil War of 1948-49. During April and May of 1962, refugees poured in from China in unprecedented numbers. Due to the shortage of land in Hong Kong, an agreement with China has been worked out to limit emigration to between 15,000 and 20,000 a year. This agreement has been broken by people seeking freedom and opportunity. Never in Hong Kong's history has there been a significant voluntary migration of people in the other direction, from Hong Kong to China. Hong Kong became a British possession for the sole purpose of trade with China. It was established as a trading post, not a settlement. Hong Kong prospered as a free port, a market, and a warehouse for goods in transit between Asia and the West. Colonial policy and the colonial office regulations which applied to Hong Kong reflect in prevalent British economic views of 19th century Britain and Adam Smith, which emphasized free trade and the passive role of government in the economy. Wealth creation was seen to reside largely in the private sector and was the responsibility of individuals and private business firms. These same principles are still in force in Hong Kong today and continue to attract tens of thousands of new arrivals to the territory. To see how Hong Kong has developed in a free market economy, I talked to Dr. Kim Cham of the Department of Management Studies in Hong Kong University. Dr. Cham, how has the economy grown since the end of the Second World War? Income per person has grown by about five times since the end of the war. What about productivity? In the last decade, productivity per worker has increased by 8% per annum, while hours of work per worker has declined by 2% per annum. This means that people are producing more but working less hours. What in your estimate accounts for the remarkable economic record in Hong Kong? This can be attributed to the workings of the free market economy and people's willingness to accept the system and the government's non-interference with the workings of the system. The diligence of the Chinese is legendary and the remarkable productivity of Hong Kong rests on its hard-working people who make maximum use of Hong Kong's free economy. Supply and demand for labor determines wage rates. I talked to this factory's managing director, Ms. Pauline Chan. Ms. Chan, how do you pay your employees? Uh, we pay our employees uh, by daily wages and monthly salaries. What other incentives and fringe benefits do you offer your workers? Uh, we have production incentives, housing subsidies, life insurance policies, medical care, and uh, meal subsidies, etc. Is there a minimum wage you have to pay your workers in Hong Kong? Uh, there is no such thing as set by the government as uh, minimum wages, as uh, this is left entirely to the private enterprises and we do it according to what we consider appropriate and also on the measurement of their efficiency and uh, in accordance with the market value as well. Are your workers organized into labor unions? Unions are not popular in Hong Kong. In our own company, uh, we pay our workers I would say quite well. How extensive are government regulations of working conditions in Hong Kong? Um, they are trying to protect the juvenile and women and uh, of course uh, safety in the manufacturing uh, environment. Uh, apart from that, and I think the government is also um, concerned about the competitiveness of the Hong Kong manufactured products that they would not be priced out of the world markets. 
working people here in Hong Kong accept the verdict of market forces. This acceptance of market forces is reflected in the virtual absence of work stoppages and labor disputes. What benefits working people most is the rapidly rising wages they have enjoyed. Most working people in Hong Kong benefit from constantly rising wages. They possess the independence and dignity that comes with individual responsibility and self-support rather than suffer the demeaning status of a welfare recipient, which in any case goes directly against the Chinese character. Workers in Hong Kong really are free to choose their way of life. A free market in labor goes hand in hand with a free market in business. Hong Kong welcomes the businessman, as Mr. Alan Lee explains. He is the chairman of the Electronics Committee of the Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce and also managing director of Ampex World Operations here. Mr. Lee, what's involved in setting up a business here in Hong Kong? Well, it takes about $40 and a few forms to fill, and you can start your own business tomorrow. What about government controls on trade and other regulations? How extensive are these? Aside from some labor and safety regulations, the government does not tell you what to build or where to sell to, and there is no price and wage control. What about government subsidies to business and other forms of protection? Can you get these for your business? No, not at all. In fact, uh, I think this forces us to compete and to be more efficient. What incentives are there for businessmen to come and do work here in Hong Kong? Profits, low taxes, and free movement of capital. A corporate profits tax is 17%, personal income tax maximum is 15%, and these conditions stimulate investment and employment. We often hear charges from overseas that this desire for profits leads to exploitation of workers and sweated labor. Is this true? 25 years ago, working conditions were not as good because most of the people working in small workshops. Today, about 5% of the factories employ 70% of the labor, and they are enjoying very good working conditions. Well then, is it difficult for you to get all the labor you need here in Hong Kong? It is very difficult. In fact, there's a labor shortage in Hong Kong. You have to pay the market price, otherwise they go to work for somebody else. Another key attraction of Hong Kong to investors is that it is a completely free market in money. The Hong Kong dollar is freely convertible into other currencies. As we hear from Mr. Paul Maynard, Vice President and Manager of Bank of America's Hong Kong branch. There's absolutely nothing aside from pure business considerations uh, which prevents the free movement of capital and financial assets in or out of Hong Kong. This is one of the great strengths of Hong Kong, the unrestricted capital inflow and outflow, which has resulted in a steady stream of investment and has helped to make Hong Kong one of the world's leading financial centers. The uh, tax rate on interest earnings is a low 15% across the board, which, needless to say, compares favorably with much higher rates in many other countries, and there's no capital gains tax at all. Are there any restrictions to overseas investment here in Hong Kong? None whatsoever. And this has been one of the great contributors to its vitality and uh, the viability of Hong Kong. There's absolutely no bias or favoritism toward so-called resident versus non-resident firms, which means that 100% ownership of any enterprise by any class of investor is permitted without restriction. Hong Kong also has the third largest gold market in the world, and it too operates completely free of government restriction. Daily gold turnover on the Chinese gold and silver exchange typically exceeds the average daily volume on all United States gold markets combined. This free market in gold typifies the absence of trade controls in general. For example, Hong Kong is a duty-free port. It allows the entry and exit of most raw materials, consumer goods, and commodities without tariffs or duties. Hong Kong seems unique in its adherence to free trade. I went to Hong Kong's Department of Trade to put the question to the Director of Trade, Mr. Peter Cho. Mr. Cho, why does Hong Kong practice free trade? We allow trade to flow as it wishes. We do that 
so as to allow a very large measure of resilience to be injected into the system. Uh, we are able to, for example, react to changed circumstances very quickly. Uh, we need to do that because we keep facing competition and we keep facing different circumstances and we have to change, we have to be adaptable. How do your manufacturers adapt their processes and products in the face of restrictions that other nations do impose on your goods? Well, when restrictions are introduced on a particular product, obviously the increasing that particular product is going to be limited. Um, when de in that situation, the industrialists here will try to realize greater profit by improving the quality of the goods. In other words, by trading up into the higher price bracket. Why don't you retaliate against other countries that impose restrictions on your goods? The direct consequence of retaliation must be the increase of costs of imports. Given that we need to import in order to export, retaliation would be self-defeating. To round out this survey of Hong Kong's economy, let's look at farming and fishing. They too are organized on the same competitive basis as industry. Despite the limited land available to agriculture, local producers and fishermen still supply a substantial proportion of fish, vegetables, and poultry that local people in Hong Kong consume. Farmers, like businessmen, respond to market forces. Over the years, they have shifted from traditional rice growing into vegetable production, which yields higher profits. No description of economic freedom in Hong Kong would be complete without some mention of the great paradox, the business dealings of the People's Republic of China with Hong Kong. Selling to and doing business in Hong Kong's market economy earns China foreign exchange that allows it to buy the goods it needs on world markets. China supplies Hong Kong with a wide range of consumer goods. The bulk of its food imports, oil storage facilities, oil products. China partially owns service stations in Hong Kong as outlets for its gasoline, and a substantial quantity of fresh water supplies. This bank is the headquarters of Peking's local banking operations. It has an advanced IBM computer linking it with 12 other China-controlled banks. China engages in joint ventures with private companies. This cement plant under construction is with Kaiser Cement of California and Cheonggung Holdings of Hong Kong. Besides ownership of several big office buildings, China has extensive shipping interests and has publicly announced plans to build factories in Hong Kong. We've seen why the refugees and immigrants come to Hong Kong. But why does the government of China itself? Because the opportunities in Hong Kong's open economy serves its needs as well as those of the refugees. Recall that Hong Kong's economy depends heavily on foreign trade. This fact alone encourages a hands-off attitude by government. The key officers of government, by the way, are housed almost entirely in this one modest building. I talked about the government's economic policy with its financial secretary, Sir Philip Haddon Cave. Well, philosophically, of course, the Hong Kong government is committed to the idea of the market-disciplined free enterprise economy. But in our externally dependent circumstances, there is, in fact, no substitute for market forces. This means, for example, that both sides of industry must accept the costs as well as the rewards of, of freedom. And in particular, I would say, businessmen uh, must never be deprived of their sacred right to lose money. So I would, rec I would describe our general approach as one of positive, and I stress positive, positive non-interventionism. What is the government's budgetary policy in Hong Kong? That is, what determines taxing and spending? We believe that right at the outset we must take a view as to the relative size of the public sector. That is to say, um, all expenditure finance from public funds. For we believe that unless we do take a view as to the relative size of the public sector, um, there is a risk that the public sector will tend to grow over time 
leading to the private sector being crowded out. And if the private sector is crowded out, then inevitably our external competitiveness will be damaged. We depend on a fast growth rate of the economy um, to generate high yields. The trend growth rate of our economy over the past 20 years has been of the order of 9% in real terms. We depend on a fast growth rate of our economy to generate high yields from low tax rates. And because our tax system is low and narrowly based, we also depend on a wide range of fees and charges for services rendered. Why do you practice a system of low tax rates? Well, essentially because we believe that a low and narrowly based system releases human effort and encourages risk-taking. If you practice a system of low tax rates, then don't you have to engage in deficit financing to pay for government spending? Uh, not at all. Our, our tax system has in fact yielded sufficient revenues over the years to finance the public sector. But surely you don't generate enough revenue every year. In 30 out of the last 33 years, we've generated more than sufficient revenue as a result. We have accumulated surpluses, and indeed interest on these accumulated surpluses is more than sufficient to pay for the annual cost of our police force. Hong Kong is not a welfare state, but those who are extremely poor can get subsidized medical care, cash allowances from the government, and some form of housing aid. The Hong Kong government began its massive public housing schemes, now home to half the territory's population, as the result of an historical disaster. A terrible fire here in the Shek Kit Mei district on Christmas Day in 1953 left 53,000 squatters, refugees from China, without shelter. The government immediately set up a resettlement department and built multi-story public housing blocks to house the fire victims and to resettle squatters from land with potential industrial value. Huge public housing schemes have continued to this day due to the chronic shortage of land and the unceasing flow of immigrants. It is true, even in Hong Kong, that once government implements any major subsidy program like housing, it is extremely hard to eliminate it. Still, the known facts of the housing shortage and overcrowding do not diminish the attraction of Hong Kong for immigrants. Yet despite overcrowding, health conditions have steadily improved. The infant mortality rate has fallen by over 95% since 1950. In Hong Kong, most people look after their own medical care. But for the very poor, the government subsidizes a health service. The government provides public funds to help the elderly and infirm. Assistance is also now available to unemployed, able-bodied adults. But they must register and prove they are actively seeking work. They must take any job offered. There are over 100 private and charitable organizations, like this floating doctor service, which dispenses help to the needy in remote islands and rural areas. Since 1971, primary and secondary education are compulsory and largely paid for by the government. Despite this transition, the proportion of children in school is not much different than it was when the parents paid. The Chinese have always valued education and traditionally paid for it themselves. Social welfare must be kept in perspective. Governments all over the world tax and borrow to finance the needs of their less fortunate citizens. Hong Kong, more than any other industrial economy, relies on the market to allocate resources and raise living standards. The remarkable growth in Hong Kong in the last three decades is due to its free economy. Low tax rates have encouraged rapid economic growth. In turn, revenues from these low rates have risen to make possible programs of public spending on housing, health, education, and other social services with virtually no need for government borrowing or the inflationary practice of deficit financing, which would have resulted in a large public debt and mortgage future generations of Hong Kong taxpayers to pay for present services. Because of Hong Kong's political circumstances, 
only a modest level of defense spending is required, most of which is borne by Hong Kong taxpayers. Social welfare in Hong Kong depends upon an economy which in turn depends upon exports, imports, and the maintenance of an environment conducive to profitable investment. Recall the basic factors that have made Hong Kong so attractive to investors, workers, and so many visitors from overseas. Low taxes, minimum of government regulation in business and private affairs, duty-free port, and the practice by government of responsible fiscal, economic, and social policies. It must be said that the prosperity of Hong Kong is largely due to the resolve of its government not to interfere with the workings of its free enterprise economy, which gives individuals the opportunity to escape from poverty largely on the basis of their own efforts. This is the same economic system which the distinguished economist Ludwig von Mises has so aptly defined. Liberty and freedom are the conditions of man within a contractual society. Social cooperation under a system of private ownership of the means of production means that within the range of the market, an individual is not bound to obey and serve an overlord. As far as he gives and serves other people, he does so of his own accord in order to be rewarded and served by others. He depends on other members of society but this dependence is mutual. The buyer depends upon the seller and the seller on the buyer. What impels every man to the utmost exertion in the service of his fellow men and curbs innate tendencies towards arbitrariness and malice is the market, not compulsion and coercion on the part of gendarme, hangmen and penal courts. It is self-interest. The member of a contractual society is free because he serves others only in serving himself. There is no kind of freedom other than the kind the market economy brings about.